Hi and welcome everyone to episode four of Talking Shop with Tony Abbey. My name is David Quinn, editor of NAFEM's Benchmark magazine, and I'll be your host today. This series is part of the wider NAFEM's community programme of online events that we're all delighted to be bringing you. You can see more details on the NAFEM's website and hopefully find something else of interest as well. The recordings of the previous episodes of Talking Shop are available on the NAFEM site and on Tony's FE training website and Tony's been hosting some Q&As on his LinkedIn feed over the, the past few weeks, which are very interesting. So we would encourage you to take a look at that as well. This week, we are looking at Moore's Circle. We will kick off with a 30 minute presentation. Then we'll open things up to your questions and comments. You can submit your questions by using the Q&A box, which is accessed via the cartoon question mark on the side of your screen. We'll then go through a selection of these at the end of the session. So without wasting any more time, I'll hand you straight over to Tony. And basically, we're going to look at um, Moore's circle. Um, what is it? Uh, it's, it's a graphical method of defining either a 2D or 3D stress state. Um, but the, the important thing is it's a quick way of guessing at or estimating some of our important stress quantities that we get interested in. And these are maximum and minimum principal stresses. And I'll talk about why we might want to use those uh, a little bit later on. Principal stress angle, maximum shear stress, and perhaps I find them one of the most important transformation to any other local coordinate system. So that sounds all very dry or kind of very boring. We'll put some examples in there. Here's a shot of more circle. And just a bit of disclaimer here, there's an app online which I've, I bought and paid for, so I'm not uh, not being sponsored anyway. It's called Me the Mechanical, uh, Mechanical App, and it's actually it's very useful as a way of actually laying out the Moore circle to scale and so on. So I've, I've I used that and taken screenshots from that. So why is Moore circle so hated? So um, first off, I do apologize if it's actually your favorite topic in structural mechanics. Um, I, I'm, I base my um, statement at the top there, the Moore's circle is a very hated thing, um, on the informal surveys. Every time I do a live training course, I kind of say to the folks, well, when we get to that part, well, here, only everybody remember Moore's circle wasn't that wonderful. And there's like this kind of like, oh, yeah, glad to, glad to be away from that. Now, there may be, um, uh, you may be the person that's sort of like, no, no, I love more circles. So my question is, well, I know everybody else is out of step. You're the guy that loves more circle. Everybody else kind of hates it. So, so it's their fault. And that's actually true in many ways. Um, more circle is actually very useful. So we can kind of um, bring it back into, into sort of maybe a little bit of pop popularity. So that, if you like, is the subplot of what I'm going to talk about today is that can we actually see some usage of it? Um, can we actually understand what it is, not necessarily use it, but just kind of appreciate what it is. Now, why is Moore's circle so hated? I think it's because it seems very arcane. Um, why are we drawing graphs and, 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 and the trig and, and so on associated with it? It's very procedural, there's a, there's, and I'll go through very briefly the procedure that we go through. And it's very confusing. There's a couple of little wrinkles. There's a couple of what I call gotchas in there, things you have to follow in this procedure, which can actually make it uh, confusing and perhaps the most important thing is never use it in practical engineering well I've actually got a confession to make here um, in the early 70s uh, mid 70s when I was actually uh, working in stress offices with no calculators no computers no nothing if we wanted to transform a stress from one direction say flowing in one direction to come to a, a stress flowing in another direction then we just do a very quick more circle graph and it is a rough and ready graph that's the idea to get an approximate idea of the stresses in different directions so I'll talk about that. So maybe I'm the outlier there. I actually have used it in practice. And then the other question is, well, why bother with all this stuff? Von Mises stress is king. That's just a scalar number. It just explains a stress state. It, we can compare that against yield stress. So why do we need all these other things which um, Moore Circle is giving us, such as uh, principal stresses, maximum shears, or indeed uh, transforming stresses? So what I'm going to try and do over the next uh, quick half an hour is explain some reason why we want to do this and sort of, again, build that motivation for not necessarily using more circle, but understanding perhaps the, the principles behind it. So this is, is this Otto Moore, and this is actually David's fault. David uh, actually, I think, found this quote uh, last week and said, Moore had a direct and unpretentious lecturing style that was popular with his students. Well, no pressure there, David. Thanks very much for that comment. So he was obviously a great teacher, a great mentor. Um, so you may think, well, how come this guy 
created such an awful sounding, an awful um, uh, looking kind of process. Well, he was a practicing engineer before he, he um, uh, joined the academic world, and he was obviously a great thinker, thinking about things. And Moore had a, a, an enthusiasm for graphs and for graphical tools. And in those days, graphical methods were very, uh, very powerful and very useful because they really um, were, were, if you like, the shortcut in those days. So I think he was really a great guy, and I think he was using this as an aid to avoid heavy mathematics. So his students, his, his own use and so on, rather than slog through the equations, which I'm going to show you very briefly, I'm not going to derive them in any sense, then you know, he was actually helping us out. So if you like, it was a very early um, computational aid to getting things which are quite tricky to kind of figure out. So that's, that's I, I think he was a great guy. Um, I love the moustache there as well, but that's, uh, I wish we could go back to those days. So imagine 1890, just after Moore had invented this process. Do you want to go through this column of equations on the left-hand side? So this is the definition of how we pick up uh, stress transformation. Theta is our local stress, uh, our local coordinate system. So the direct stresses are given here. Uh, the shear stress is going here. We've got to slog through that. We want to find our principal stresses, extreme shear stresses, and um, the maximum principal stress. Uh, these are the angles and these are the actual values. If you're faced with that in 1890, you've got nothing but maybe um, uh, log tables. I don't know if slide rules were invented then. Then this is, this is daunting. Um, on the other hand, you've got a drawing board, you've got some paper, and most importantly, you've got a, a compass here. And remember the compasses, then basically you can loft this out and you've got yourself a calculation tool. So why would an engineer do this in 1890 when he can do this and, and create the more circles? So it was a fantastic computational aid that came through. And I think um, that's really the kind of the credit and the upsell we should be giving to, to our friend uh, Otto Moore there. So today, obviously, I've got the online app, and this is a quick snapshot of that mechanical thing I talked about. And it's rather nice because I've got more circle. I've also got the little stress um, squares, which show us the components of stress, the orientation. Again, I've taken further snapshots of examples, so I'll kind of use that. Again, I'm not pushing mechanical. I must uh, stress that. There are many uh, online apps. We've also got uh, calculators, so we can actually um, either do the equations one by one, we can program in, there's obviously Excel spreadsheet as well, so there's many applications we can quickly get the answer. I remember when the TI-59 calculator came out with memories and so on, um, this would be like the uh, really the early 80s, suddenly, wow, there's a whole new world out there, we can do things such as program things like Moore Circle and uh, small applications and so on. But the real powerhouse is FEA. With FEA, this is, we get into this, this is a transformed stress state. There's thousands and hundreds of thousands of little more circle calculations being done instantaneously with this little picture here. So today, yes, we don't have to draw the graphs, um, but you know, uh, we are still using the same principles. And so uh, more, understanding more circle as a kind of, as a teaching aid, I think is really, um, and maybe a self-teaching aid, is, is a great way of going now. So that's basically the, the approach I would go there. We don't want to go to, back to graphs, but it can help us understand why do stress transformations, uh, sorry, why do stress transformations? What are stress transformations? Why are we using them? I think you know, we can do some interesting stuff there. So um, if we look at stress transformations, what are they? This is a kaleidoscope. So we peer down here, and we basically spin this little um, disk around. Now, my analogy here is that this disk is like the stress state. We're not changing what other objects or pretty uh, colors we want to put in here. We're just changing our orientation or our view. So essentially, we're spinning this kaleidoscope around. And that's exactly what we do when we look at stress transformations. We're looking at stress at a point, And this little square here is assumed to be an infinitely small little point. And then we're saying, well, I want to look at it in a different way. So I'm just rotating it round. It's not changing the stress state. It's just changing the picture, rotating the view. And I think I always uh, kind of say it's like a kaleidoscope. Now, some people don't remember what a kaleidoscope is. It's a beautiful old Victorian example of just spinning the same stress state, spinning it round to get the view that we want. And there are the reasons we want to look for local transformations or particular transformations. So that's the kind of the background uh, behind it all. So let's 
think of an example. Here's, um, let's say, like a tensile test specimen. It's just a, a rod. It's just a circular cross-section. We're just putting an axial force P down there, uh, force over area, and we just get uh, axial stress SX, I'll call it. Now, that's, that's boring. It's uniaxial. Why do I want to transform that? Why do I need more circle or anything else to deal with that? It's just a stress, which is um, uniaxial. We're not coupling it with any other stress, so it's very easy. Well, one question would be, imagine I actually put a weld line or a bond, like a glue line or something like that, or maybe a rivet line if it's a, a panel, then a panel. And now I, I lay that um, bond line or that weld uh, uh, through their angle theta. Now I'm not interested in the axial stress. Away from there, yes, uh, overall failure, tensile failure of the, of the bar or whatever it is, is important. But on the glue line, the bond line, or the rivet line, now I get interested in what we call the component uh, stresses. So what's important to me is for a bond, for example, how much uh, can that bond take in shear, uh, which perhaps is tending to delaminate this way, and how much can it take as a peel stress pulling the other way? So my properties and my testing is associated with the stress in this coordinate system here. So even with the humble uh, rod here, which is only seeing uniaxial stress, I could have a situation where I'm interested in the failure mode in that particular direction. And that's really one of the key things. We're not going to just assume necessarily a stress in the direction we're given, which is just this uh, Cartesian coordinate system here. I want to rotate it to something which is more useful to me. So anything which is like a bond line, rivet line, weld line, anything like that, I might want to look at that stress state from that particular perspective. And some materials um, are going to be uh, want to fail in shear um, before they fail in, in tension. So in that particular case, I'd be very interested in the angle and the stress it developed here because that might be the mode of failure of the specimen. Sometimes we see for um, uh, different types of materials, we see a failure at 45 degrees, which we'll see is the maximum uh, shear angle. Sometimes we see it uh, straight across, cut across here, which is a tensile failure. So it can be uh, component dependent. It can be material dependent. We get interested in just not taking the uniaxial. Sometimes there's, there's more going on in there. And again, that was a terrible pun. More, more circle. So <laughs> more information. I just thought of that. Sorry, David. Terrible puns. You know me. I'm terrible at puns. So, okay, this is the boring bit. How do we get our equations here? Well, I'm not going to go through this, but on the, on the basic uh, course, um, uh, actually on the fatigue course, where um, principal stresses are very important, we actually go through a little, um, a little section like that. So we, we take our, like our rectangle, we cut a, 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 uh, an angle through it, and then we can do a balance. Now, you can't do a stress balance directly. That's the trick, because uh, stresses are not vectors. They are um, matrices or uh, tensors, if you like. So what you have to do is to turn this into put lengths and depths on. So then I can say, well, that stress has actually got, a, they've got this length here. You've got a depth, so you turn that into an area. And then you can turn out a force. So you can do a force balance, and then you convert that back to a stress. So if you go through that process, you can figure out what the stress is in the normal direction in this cut face theta and what the shear stress in that cut face theta. So that's basically the idea behind it. And again, I won't go through that, but that's basically what we can do. And if we do it in 3D, horrendous set of equations come out. So what Moore did was look at those equations and say, because he's so keen on graphs, and he's sort of thinking, I can see the equation of a circle in there. Now, you have to have a particular mindset to be able to see things like that, but um, we'll see it just falls into a graphical representation of a circle, believe it or not. So rather than mess with all that, we see where it comes from uh, very briefly, very brief overview. If you want to dive deeper, um, then either come on the course or, or uh, look at the textbooks, which actually shows how that's done. So let's look at a little example of this. Um, again, I'm using that little calculator online. Um, and basically, this is the axial stress. And let's assume 100 megapascals. Um, I don't know, what's that, um, say 20,000 PSI, something like that applied axially. And it could be, well, that's, that's it, that's all we've got. So we look at the little uh, stress square, and here's the axial stress. We we'll say it's in the x direction, it's 100, nothing in y, and there's no shear in there. So the shear is the double-headed arrows pointing towards the corners. For, to describe shear, I was uh, sort of uh, say, well, if you imagine um, you've got um, something like a, um, a piece of paper, 
Take, take that piece of paper, and now I want to put shear on that. So what are we going to do? We're going to grip that side, pull that up, pull that down. That's a simple definition of shear. But we always have to close the arrow. So we always have to have a balanced state, so we end up with a shear state that looks like that. So that's basically the, um, the idea of um, uh, a shear stress. That's uh, kind of, I've just found my found my bouncing ball after all that. Great. So basically, it's the shear state that we see in here. And but the shear state, having said all that, is zero. Now I do my cut through here, uh, an angle theta. And so in the app, I just say, I want to rotate my stress system through theta. And this is the rotated stress system now. And now I have the stress normal coming up. And this was 30 degrees. So there's the normal stress now. That's the stress poking out. And then the shear stress is, um, is shown in here and that's 43 units. So I can say the tension across the joint is 75 megapascals. Maybe that's critical. A shear across the joint is 43. If it's tension dominated, I use that. If it's shear dominated, I'd use that. Um, if it's uh, some sort of um, interaction between them, um, then I, I might use the interaction equation. So we, we could say, um, let's um, uh, designer might ask the question, what um, OK, this is what we design at 30 degrees. Uh, and then we've got good data. We can look at if it's a bolt group, uh, it's a rivet group, if it's a bond line. Now I've got good data I can use exactly in that strength calculation because of the stress transformation. And again, behind the scenes, it's just like more circle. But then the design might say, well, what giant angle gives the biggest shear? Um, and he might be concerned about that. And the answer is actually 45 degrees. Um, if we rotate through 45 degrees, which is the case in here, the biggest shear we find is 50 uh, megapascals with a, a corresponding tension of uh, 50 megapascals. Now, the key thing here is we're not changing the stress state. Remember our kaleidoscope. We're just changing our view of it. This guy wants to know what's the maximum shear I could find. Um, maybe we've got a shear dominant uh, failure mode or something like that, or just curiosity. What's the biggest shear we can find? What is that angle we'd rotate around, which is the worst case? So that might dominate the bond strength. Or maybe the 90 degree critical joint line is, is uh, 90 joint degree joint line is critical. And that's just our original boring diagram. It's just basically the tension is 100 and shear is zero. So we can think of cut lines, uh, manufacturing lines, joint lines, things like that. Well, we could actually link this to a strength interaction equation where you're saying for something like a, a, a rivet, we've got pull out and we've got shear. Well, there's an interaction equation between those. We could actually look at that and study it and say, what's the best angle to actually put uh, the, 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 um, the joint line in there? So lots and lots of um, motivations for kind of doing, uh, doing all this stuff. Now, we found some special values as we went through there. The designer said, well, what's the biggest shear? We found an angle, which in our particular case is 45 degrees, and that gave us a value of 50 megapascals. You can't get a bigger shear than that in our simple little system here. So that's an important value because it may be that we have to actually stress uh, this compared to a yield stress in shear. And the biggest value we've got is the, the principal shear. So that's a useful quantity. What's the biggest direct stress, the tension stress? Well, that's 100 megapascals. That might be important to us. Um, particularly like in fatigue, for example, if we're thinking about fatigue cracks, what would be the worst orientation for fatigue crack? Well, here it's pretty clearly going to be a uh, crack running 90 degrees running in here. You can't get any bigger than that. So the biggest or maximum principal stress there for, for fatigue is, is a very, very uh, useful uh, feature. What's the smallest uh, stress or the most negative? The minimum stress in our particular case is just zero. There's nothing going on the uh, y-axis, so this tends to give us zero. But again, this could be a large negative number, and that could be a local crippling or buckling type mode. And we want to know what's the orientation of that. If I've got a flange or something orientated that way, this becomes important to us. So these aren't just kind of dry quantities, kind of theoretical quantities. They are actually, uh, can be very useful in design, uh, checking uh, components and so on. Um, if I'd applied a, stress, a compressive force instead of tension, these would have uh, swapped around. So my minimum principal stress would have been minus 100 megapascals. My maximum would have been 100. I had a question on the course, um, uh, on our course yesterday, which was the intro course, and said, that how do we get um, a minimum principal stress, which is um, negative? And that's, that's how we do it. Um, 
and so on. So again, playing around with more circle, we can we can see what happens there. Now I'm gonna I'm gonna draw a very simple more circle. I, I'm not gonna have a great teaching on this. I think I might do some uh, other videos, put them on my channel, put them on uh, YouTube, just to kind of go through it. There's there's a lot out there, but um, I, you always like to kind of do your own. So our stress state we saw was x direction 100 megapascal, y zero, shear zero. So the way that's laid out on a graph paper, and imagine now we're going to draw graph paper. We don't want to. We can use geometry and trigonometry to actually get exact values, but then to be honest, we might as well use a calculator. So laying out roughly on graph paper, I can get a feel to within five to ten percent what the stresses are. So this is our stress state. We've got three stress quantities in 2D. Um, if we were going for uh, 3D, it gets more complicated. I'm leaving it to 2D. So we need two points on our graph. The vertical axis is all about what, how much shear have we got. And so we have a positive shear and negative shear. That's just changing the sense of our, um, of our uh, little diagrams. So just very quickly, positive shear uh, could be like this. And we, we, got, we have an arbitrary definition. I'm just saying that's positive shear that way. Uh, and then negative shear is just the reverse. So we start off reversing these two arrows. And then the other, every, remember, everything comes to a head here. It comes to a head in here, and I can make up my own mind. I think I actually said that's positive, and that's um, that's negative. So that's the positive shear up there. It's the negative shear up there. So the shear state is plotted up here. How much shear have we got? The direct stress, which is going to be tension or compression, is plotted on this axis. So it means I can actually take a stress state with so much sigma x, so much sigma y, so much uh, tor x y or s x y, and I can plot it. Two points of plot are the S x direction stress and the negative shear, that's the first point, and then I plot the y directional stress. So in my case, the first point ends up there because that's S x and my shear is zero. S y is zero and the shear is zero. So that's probably the most simplest, most boring, uh, more circle I can draw. So that's what we do. We plot those two points. Now there's a little bit of um, issues about what we decide is um, the uh, the sense of the shears. Some people actually plot positive shear downwards and so on. I'll talk about briefly of that uh, in a slide or two. But that's basically the idea. It's a way of mapping the stress state into uh, 2D. And then more spotted, we can actually draw circles through there. So there's maximum principle, minimum principle. We take the average and, um, uh, sorry, I haven't quite got there. There's SX, uh, there's SY. We take the average of those and we get a point in the middle there. That point in the middle we use to generate the famous Mohr circle. So there goes the circle, and all it is is just taking those two points uh, and basically uh, plotting between them. Now, if we've got shear state, then we can actually draw a point up here and a point down in here, but it'd be the same idea. We then have a point with a non-zero shear stress. We're going to have a point, say, like that. Those would be our two points in there. So again, we get a point uh, which is up here point which is up here we draw that line through and lo and behold we get the same center point and then and then we're in business so that's basically the idea now from this um, let me just get rid of those um, those bits um, we can actually pull out uh, a couple of things the maximum minimum principal stress is found because it's basically what's the biggest um, value to the right that's our maximum principal stress. What's the biggest value to the left? That's our minimum principal stress. So if a different stress state, we could have this, whether it be the maximum minimum. We could even have this. That would be a compressive dominated state. This would be a tensile dominated state. So we can have these circles anywhere we like. And again, they, they kind of tell a story in there. Um, so maximum minimum principal stress is, is picked off very easily. In my case, it's just sigma x equals that, sigma y equals that, and that's a kind of a very simple case. Maximum shear, again, this, the radius of this circle is 50, and more spotted, there's an equation link between the radius and the terms in the equation. So there's 50 megapascal up there, and it's great. We didn't have to do any calculations or anything like that. Imagine laying that, laying that on a graph paper. Very simple to do. If I wanted to figure out my 30-degree cut, well, um, I think I've got a slide showing that uh, coming up shortly. Yes, we do. So if I wanted to do my 30-degree cut, then basically I just come in and plot a, a rotation. Now, there's one little thing in here. The more angle, as I've called it, the angle in your... Um, 
in your diagram is twice the actual angle. My actual angle was 30, so my more angle is, is 60. You, so if you draw this and, and subtend 60 degrees there um, with a compass and then intercept in there and look these values up, you get very quickly, let's say, to within, let's say, 2 or 3%, depending on how accurate you are, very quickly I can say that's the stress transformation. If you wanted to look at stress transformation around here, say within interaction equation, it's not actually a bad thing to sketch out in the Moore circle and give you a rough estimate there. We don't need to do trigonometrically uh, absolutely precise. So I think, again, it's, it's a great, uh, great kind of technique. So that's basically what we're doing there. So in that particular case, we get the intercept here is 75 uh, uh, direct. Um, we get 43.3 shear. And down in here, we get 25 direct and minus 43.3 shear here. The shears are always opposite uh, in sense, uh, but the same value. And then the direct stresses are whatever they, they turn out to be. And that ties up with the diagram we saw before. So a very, very simple example. I recommend uh, you kind of get an app like I've got, study it, think about it. I'm very tempted to do maybe a slightly uh, longer video. Again, I can put that into a kind of a series. I can upload it somewhere. If anybody's interested, let me know. We can kind of talk through this as well. But I think the key thing is, you know, why are we doing that? What's the motivation? The motivation is quick trans stress transformations because I'm interested in local directions. Now, I'll stop there just to kind of give a flavor. And as I said, we could do a fuller video with more examples. Now, there's two wrinkles. And wrinkle is an old English phrase meaning um, there's two things or two gotchas you've got to watch out for. Now, we talked about the double more angle. Remember I said I've got to go to 60 degrees, not 30 on my graph. Well, why is that? Well, everything in here is, is a factor of 2 theta. So this is why we got it. All our equations, which we're trying to map these to a neat graphical form, they map to basically the double angle, uh, which, is, which is in here. Another way of looking at it is that's the x-directional stress, 100 megapascals. In my particular case, the y-directional stress is a zero. Or another way, local coordinate system, local x is 75, local y is 25. But notice they're 180 degrees apart. That doesn't make any sense. In practice, this would be the stress in that direction, sigma x, there's sigma y, there's my 90 degrees. And that's a practical in indication of that's the real stress, or the real world stress, or the real world angle. The more world angle, or the more circle angle, is twice the, the normal angle. So there we got 180 degrees. Divide that by two, we get him back to 90 degrees. So that's one of the, the slight confusions. The other one is um, the sense of the shear. Um, some people plot the shear axis up positive, which I tend to do. Then axis rotations are positive anticlockwise. I talked about rotating my stress uh, my, around when I rotated around that sense. So I went off in kind of in, in that direction there. Um, and I, when I draw my diagram, this is the positive sense. Other people reverse it. They actually draw the vertical shear axis going down. And then they can rotate this way and, and so on. Some texts and apps reverse this convention. It doesn't make any difference to the answers, but it's just one of those tricky things. We've got to differentiate between positive and negative shear because we've got to draw two points. That's probably the, the, the tricky bit in there. Uh, here's a, a slightly more complicated example. Uh, imagine this is like um, going to be an aircraft uh, fuselage, and I've got, let's say, the um, uh, the top of, uh, oh, that's the big blob. I don't want the big blob. I want the little pen there. So they have got a, a, a pretty big uh, large diameter aircraft fuselage. I've got hoop stress running around here, axial stress running through here. And I also put some shear on as well. I'm not going to draw, well, I'll draw the arrowheads for that one. So we've got um, axial stress, um, PR over 2T, that's the little one. And I've said that's 100 uh, megapascals. Hoop stress is 200 megapascals. And let's say there's some twist in this fuselage due to maybe um, uh, a roll going in, so differential aileron, and that puts a shear state in. So that gives me a, a more a normal kind of a general stress state. Here's the more circle. I can pick off, again, um, my uh, point in here, which is my, uh, my 200 in X, 45 in shear. Uh, 100 in Y and minus 45 in shear. There's my two points. There's my center. There's my circle. And then any transformation I want to do. 
So in fact, if I look at the maximum principal angle, that's actually at 69 degrees. So fatigue cracks at 69 degrees running through here uh, or normal to that would, well, in fact, 69 degrees, that would be the critical direction for, say, a fatigue crack growth. Very, very useful thing to, to find out. That's actually called the, the, the principal angle. And we often plot that in fatigue to tell us, well, what would be the worst orientation angle for, um, for, uh, for a fatigue crack? So lots and lots of applications again there. Um, if I want to do a cut line now at 20 degrees, um, then basically I can say uh, here I want to put a rivet line or a bolt line across the top of my aircraft skin at 20 degrees. What's the stress state I'm going to get interested in there? Well, there's the tensile stress pulling there, and there's the shear stress running in there. So I've rotated my system around there. And now I've got 159 a tension and 66 shear, which could be critical for my uh, local calculation of my, my strength in that particular um, position. Now, we'll just finish off again. I'm afraid, as usual, I've overrun. Um, I'm just going to see more circle now with the power of FEA. So we've got millions of more circles created with this stress coordinate system. Uh, and we're going to transform uh, all of these more circles in the post processor. So the power of the modern computer, millions and millions of transformations done instantly. So what I've got here is, is uh, some sort of support bracket. Um, I built it in at the end here. And I've got uh, a vertical load being split between top and bottom. And I've also got a couple going in. So there's a load uh, to the right and there's a load to the left. That's the loading state in there. So I can plot the magic more circle, uh, sorry, uh, von Mises stress which is great because it tells me where the peak stresses are. There's a peak stress here, there's some here, there's some down in here, and so on. I typically define these as zones. But it doesn't tell me anything about the stress components. It just tells me this is the maximum value, and I can compare that against yield. So I want to use these component stresses to say, well, what's going on? Now, the extractional stress running this way is given to me, so that's fine because that's the actual coordinate system that I inherit perhaps from CAD. So extractional stress flowing in the top here and flowing in the bottom is useful. Because now, as I can see, I've got uh, tension and compression. It all makes sense. Stress flowing across this member here or this member here in the extraction is no use to me, but I've got a very useful local coordinate system. It's not all the stress. I'm picking out a stress quantity there. But here, for example, in zone C, which is which here, I can see it starts off pretty well membrane. But then I'm getting some bending. I'm getting a, a kink or a, uh, a tweak coming in here. So I pick up some bending stresses as I come towards this point in here. Then I can say, well, let's look at the y-directional stresses. So now I'm looking at stresses flowing that way. Over here and over here, it's, it's meaningless. doesn't help me. But up here, that's the direction the stress is flowing. And that actually gives me a very interesting result. Right in here, now I can see the tension and compression is actually a great big tweak. It's a, it's a bending moment occurring in here. And interestingly, down at the center region in here, the load and stress in here is just pretty well zero. So I get a big tweak in here and no load being applied. The lesson from this is I've got a bad design here. If I actually orientate that lug, so the lug actually drops down so that it's in line. So there's the lug, let's say, draw it like that. And I get the line of action of that lug in line with my top um, uh, and corresponding bottom member, then the load line is running straight down there. And in that particular case, I don't get this little tweak moment in here. Shown by this diagram here, there's the tweak moment. And also the previous one, I see the tweak moment coming in here. So I can get rid of that by just changing my design so that the load is, is aligned. The other question is, well, what's going down on here? I'm pumping the load in here and the load in here. They're equal. There's no load transfer going down that member. So I can actually get rid of the member. So aligning the lugs here, losing that. So I've got a, a, a basically a load system here, a load system in here. But that is going to save me a lot of time, effort, and, and weight, and, and potential fatigue, and all the other things. Found by interrogating the strategy, not just looking at um, uh, von, Mises, uh, von Mises. Here's the local Moore system trans, uh, transformation done on this millions of scales. I'm interested in the stress flowing in down in that direction. So I set myself up a local coordinate system, transform everything to that. And I can see the stress flowing down here. It's membrane plus bending. Three 
times the nominal stress which is flowing down there. Oops, that's the stress I'm likely to see. So checking, design, all sorts of things are useful to understand. These local stress uh, transformations, which we can, again, uh, thank Mr. Moore for. Again, here's the maximum principal stress, in this particular case, running around here. And I plotted that as contours, but also as an XY plot running around there. So for fatigue, um, I'm going to get interested in that point, which is about there. So that's pulling a crack apart at the surface. So that's typical application of, of maximum principle. Minimum principle is occurring here, and it's just that we just about caught it just down in here, the biggest negative number. If this was a thin walled flange sitting here, so this was a thin plate and with a flange on the edge, we could get flange crippling locally. Where we've got large local compressive force. So a usage for uh, minimum principal stress, local buckling. So there is a point to uh, everything we're kind of doing here, everything that Moore is trying to do. I think there's a point there. So in summary, Otto Moore was a nice guy and created a useful tool. And to be honest, I wish, like on many things, I wish I'd listened more closely in college. It, in I, my case, actually, I do sometimes do graphs, and certainly in the old days, quick rough and ready graph. But basically, the principles and the method to understand what we, what, why, uh, how we're doing stress tr transformations. And uh, hopefully I've showed why we're doing it, but how we do it, stress transformations are important. So I guess one of the immediate questions we can ask is, did I convince you? Have I given more, uh, a bit of a boost there? Uh, or maybe you're thinking, you know, maybe it's uh, still as bad as ever. So thanks very much for, for watching. As David mentioned, we'll be posting the uh, uh, on YouTube and on our various websites. So watch out for that link, which will be coming very shortly. And then uh, the next session is going to be on May the 1st. And we're going to look at, again, a slightly tongue-in-cheek, nonlinear buckling. We cheat. We actually we, we do something rather odd there to actually get this buckling to work. So a lot of you will know what that is. But basically, why do we cheat? Why, why is it not really cheating? Um, so with that, David, I'll hand over to you to, uh, to, um, to wrap up for us and take us into the Q&A. Thanks very much, Tony. So did Tony convince you? Are you convinced uh, about Moore's circle? Did you learn something uh, in a better way than you may have done at college? Uh, we're over at Q&A. We have a few uh, that are coming in now. Uh, apologies to, to everyone, by the way, if there were a few glitches during the WebEx presentation. Nothing major, but there were a few uh, ins and outs and cursor issues. WebEx uh, has not been our friend in the past few weeks, as a few, most of the NAFEMS organization will be able to tell you. But hopefully you can see the questions that are they're still coming in there, Tony. Uh, quite a few people have some comments. Somebody says, completely convinced. Thank you, Tony. Uh, that, <laughs> that's good news. There's a couple of comments. I apologize for not being able to find the cursor uh, initially. Ivan makes a comment. It's not much different from the Smith chart for admittance apart from the Smith charts are normalized. I, to be honest, I don't know what a Smith chart is. So what I'll do is I'll do a bit of research on that either and figure out what, what that is. Tune asks a question, hi Tony, when, when I'm modeling a 3D component using shell element, sometimes get a third principal stress. Isn't that shell on a plain stress element with only two principal stresses? Yes, that we can say that um, if you think of um, a stress state in 2D, what we've drawn is um, the principal stresses where we've talked about P1, which was my biggest stress component on the Moore circle. That's over to the right. And then typically we say P2 is over to the left here. And um, that sits on the, uh, on, the, on, the, um, on the axis. Now, with the three-dimensional stress state, we actually um, we have a more complicated uh, diagram, which I'm not going to get into. We have P1 is our maximum principal stress. P3 becomes our minimum principal stress, and P2 is a not very interesting um, stress state in the middle. It's, it's our middle principal stress. So basically, um, what we say is that if we're dealing with 2D stress states, um, sometimes it's described as P1 and P1. That stays the same. But sometimes P2 is described as P3. It's kind of trying to imply that there should be uh, P2 perhaps, but very often, we, we can either see in uh, 2D uh, plane stress um, problems, it described minimum principal stress described as P2, but sometimes as P3. Strictly speaking, it's going to be P2. So either of those will, will work there. I think that hopefully that will um, answer that question. 
And we also have a kind of comment coming down here. The shear stress is, is 45 degrees from the normal stress. Um, in a particular case, that's what we saw there, the direct stresses and the, the shear stresses. Um, or we can plot it or we can relate it in terms of um, just maximum principal stresses, but it certainly is bringing in the shear stress there. So um, uh, I didn't quite uh, understand that comment. Randy, uh, comment of Von Mises, ductile failure theory. So in checking one's FE answer, more circle can be very useful in analyzing other non-ductile materials. Yes, um, that, that's true. So if you're looking at a brittle material, it might, and that's really the point, von Mises is just giving you um, like a, a scalar equivalent number. It's not actually looking at the component stresses. And as I mentioned, I talked about um, like a component, let's say like a bottom line or a rivet line, where maybe shear is critical, maybe direct stress is critical. In a non-ductile material, it, well, it might well be that the shear failure is more important than the tensile failure, it again then becomes a material dependent failure mode. So what the, von, the Mohr circle or any stress run transformation is doing is getting us to dive in um, to look at the material in a, uh, that stress state in a more specific way. And that's really the whole point about it. Um, okay, there's lots of convincing, good. Um, the, different, the connection with the different failure modes is critical, uh, no pun intended. Uh, that's coming from Josh. And I think, Josh, that for me was like the the eureka moment. Why are we bothering to do this? Why are we bothering to do our stress run transformations? Its component directions are useful, as I showed you, the 45 degree angle coming across is very useful, but also the failure mode. I've tried to sort of relate it to bolts and uh, rivet groups, for example, and bond lines, which we can see that physically. But I think uh, equally, with, as we people have said, different uh, brittle failure modes, ductile failure modes, the actual um, component or the material gets interested in the way we view the stress. Our kaleidoscope, if you think of it that way, the material component wants to know from a particular orientation, not just um, always uh, von Mises or not always uh, the direct stress. Um, it can be something more subtle than that. So again, another convinced um, in there. I think we should have had a poll here there, David. It may have been a good idea. <laughs> yes. Um, Shahid says, is the origin always supposed to be on the x-axis? Can, be the off, can there be an off, uh, offset from the x-axis? No, because um, basically um, when we draw our circle, um, so here's our x-axis, which is going to be direct. Here's our shear in here. If you remember, we are basically uh, always ending up with a circle which looks like this. Now, the circle can move around, but buried in the equations, which I'm not going to go back to, is basically Sx plus Xy divided by 2. And that's essentially giving us that, that center point uh, right in here. Um, so that is actually, if you tease it out and look at the equation form, then that's, um, so there we go, shift it to the middle. That actually forms part of the equation. So that's the, the reason why it sits on the x-axis. And it's basically that point is the average of the Sx plus Xy divided by 2. It's going to give me that point in there, and so on. There's lots of, we could, we could spend um, another half an hour looking at the equation and looking at the geometry of this, um, of the Mohr circle. And there's a one-to-one -one fit, because that's exactly what Mohr spotted, and that's basically what, what it's all about. Can you explain what happens when Sx equals Sxy in the hydrostatic case? Yeah, it, it, if there's no shear, it all reverts down to a blob in the center. Sx equals Sy, and we, we get no radius. Um, and that's what we call a, there's no what we call deviatoric stresses. So it's, there's no shearing or tearing or ripping stresses. It's all um, an equal dilational stress state. I'll perhaps explain that a little bit more. Um, with some diagrams when I go through the um, uh, go through the the wash up when I curate the Q and A. <laughs> uh, I think that's I can't quite see if it's Jerry or Jenny. Uh, my apologies. FEA von Mises makes us lazy. That that's true. On the other hand, the way I look at it, it's an entry point. Uh, von Mises tells us where we've got problems, and then we can dive in and say, okay, what's going on in here? So um, yes, if you only ever plotted von Mises and and to be honest, if you're a designer, you, you don't necessarily want to get into all this, although hopefully I've seen some, some uh, motivations for doing it. You're basically concerned about, is my structure 
uh, below yield, and I'm using bond mice as, as that yield criteria, I, and my metric against yield, and that's my first pass. And then I'm, I'm changing the layout, I'm messing around with things. I'm sorry, that's a bad phrase. I'm evolving my design, and basically I'm coming up with um, uh, stress dates. I want to see them quickly. I don't have time to dive into this. So I'd say it's horses for courses. Sometimes one mice is very quick, very useful. If I'm an analyst and trying to answer the question, why is it behaving like this, and potentially why my uh, structures fail, then yeah, I really got to dive down in deeper in that. Uh, so, <laughs> ah, here we have, um, uh, Ed, if I can say, you're the soldier that's marching out of step because you say you're already a fan of Moore's Circle. Actually, all power to you. Um, I enjoyed the Moore's uh, info pun. Um, it wasn't good as the one about using the, the same principles as the 1930s. I had to be really careful to say the principle of a thing and the principal angle, make sure I use the right term in there. And uh, spell checker doesn't help you there. So yeah, um, you love more circles, that's great. I, I'm, a, I'm a, a convert to more circle for using it in a rough and ready way, as I say, with graph paper. But I think more, perhaps, uh, again, I've done it again, terrible pun. Uh, but in addition, um, actually, um, helping to understand our stress states, which is what it's all about. Just to cut across you, Tony, I've opened a little poll to see if people are convinced about more <laughs> circle. Uh, that will be run, running for the next three minutes. So head to the polling uh, and select your answer. We'll, we'll have a look at the end. Yeah, good, good for you, David. That, 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 would be, that would be fun. Would it be more useful to use stress triaxiality to view, visualize the stress states rather than viewing a principal stress individually? I think there, if we're using um, three-dimensional Moore circle, um, again, I think that's for a later video, probably not in this series, um, but we can certainly expand that to include a three-dimensional uh, stress state uh, in there. Are principal stress com strain components and angles the same as principal stresses? A question coming from Josh. Yes, we actually use, uh, they're obviously a different uh, physical quantity, strains rather than stresses, but they're obviously directly related through um, through um, our constitutive uh, material properties, Young's modulus um, in uniaxial. But we can drive uh, exactly the same equation as we had for uh, the, the, the principal stresses, maximum shear stress, we can drive, and the transformations, we can drive exactly the same equations for strains. And so, in fact, the strain transformation can be done the same way. In fatigue analysis, if, for example, if we're using um, low cycle fatigue and we're interested in strains because we've got plasticity coming in, we would we would map exactly this idea uh, from stresses to strains. We'd actually use a strain more circle uh, rather than a stress more circle or the implications of that. We'd be using a strain transformation. Can there be a more circle for an open section, say the cross section of C section or S section? What would happen to the shear flows there? Will more circle be uses, useful in such cases as well? Yes, um, a couple of questions in there. What is uh, shear flow um, and how does that relate to shear stress? That's actually an interesting discussion in its own right. Let's be like another 15 minutes to kind of explain that. Funnily enough, we did that yesterday on the introductory uh, FEA course, which just finished yesterday. Um, yes, it's still useful there. If I'll try and think of a little scenario when I answer the question, but basically, yeah, more circle is, is applicable anywhere. If I've got something like um, a splice in a, in a structure, so um, let's say this is a panel, but it's made up of the top, um, well, let's say just splice two panels like that. And now I've got uh, a bond, or well, let's say a rivet line running down here. Well, if my load orientation is an orientation, say, over here, whatever it might be, or I've got shears in the panel, whatever it is, um, this is actually aligned at a, an angle then I can well transform the stresses to actually understand the shear or the shear flow in the boundaries of here. So in that particular case, imagine rotating the system around and I've got two edges then. Uh, here's the edge of say one component, edge of the other component. Now I'm interested in the shears flowing in that direction there, that direction there. And so more circle again has created that transformation for me. Or I just transform the stresses there. It's a slightly more subtle picture we'd be picking up there, but again, it's um, it's a good good question. Um, again, this is Rodrigo saying as a recap uh, on more um, why it still matters. Can you explain there again the relationship between real stress and more stresses? 
the double angle, 90 versus 180. Um, yeah, let's go quickly back to those slides there. Here, I think, is this idea of the double angle. In the equations, which more looked at these equations and said, I, more being smart guy, I spot a, um, a graphical representation of this or a geometric representation. So looking at these, he could say, um, again, a uh, brilliant mathematician or mathematical mind can see that. I can relate that back to laying that out on a diagram like this. Now the diagram here, notice every equation has this two theta. So everything, uh, we could call that phi. So instead of two theta, let's call it phi. So if we call it phi, then we can write our equation in terms of phi. We can lay out our circle in terms of phi. So we call this, we could call this phi, but we know that phi is two theta. So this is the equations of that, uh, of the circle mapped here graphically, but with phi instead of theta. Two theta equals phi. Come over here, substitute it in there, and that's why we make that little substitution. So I call this the more angle is, is two theta or phi. The actual real angle transformation is theta. Oh, uh, I, sorry, I can't see the Jerry or Jenny. Don't bother looking up the Smith chart. It's usually exclusively in RF engineering. Now, I know um, actually that um, uh, I is very much involved in that area. So I guess I get you two to talk to each other. When estimating the state, this is from uh, Athan, Athanasis. I, again, I do apologize for my uh, pronunciation. I'll, I'll cut and paste this out so we know who's asking the question. When estimating the safety factor, should we be using the maximum principal stress only, or should we be considering other angles as well? It depends on the, on the application. Um, uh, if we're talking about something which is um, predominantly a uni, uh, we want to transform that to uniaxial load state, we could talk about uh, we've got a local uh, direction and that direction is aligned with the principal stress, we might use the principal stress. Um, for some things such as my uh, fa standby favorite plate with a hole in it, um, the, for example, in that particular case, the um, stress which is running tangentially at this point here is actually an X direction stress. It also happens to be a maximum principal stress. Some certification authorities will want you to look at maximum principal stress and actually compare yield against that. And um, some maritime certification authorities have actually had to compare maximum principal stress against yield, maximum shear stress, so shear yield stress, and also von Mises against. So it really depends on the, um, the certification authority. And also from a common sense point of view, my typical application is that if it's a fatigue crack, I'm always thinking maximum principal stress positive, running normal to that crack direction. That's the worst case scenario. Now, if the maximum principal stress is not actually quite aligned with that, very often what we do is kind of swing it round and say, it's not quite normal to that. So let's swing it round. So the worst case scenario is maximum principal meets that angle at 90 degrees. So that's like a conservative assumption we make. We do the same thing with uh, local crippling as well. Lewis asks the questions on the diagram in work area two. Let's go back to work area two. It's great you can refer to these. Um, do you have a little circle on the left, and therefore the true stress is the large circle on the right of the origin? Um, no, this, would, this little circle is actually a point. So it's actually, um, WebEx is very difficult to get hold of these things because they have handles. Instead of drawing a circle, if I draw another icon in here, let's do that. It's the center there. So I apologize, it's not meant to be a circle. Is the geometric center point of those uh, those two uh, positions in there? Uh, good work on spreading the more circle theory. Um, I he this is coming from Giovanni. I found that, oft, that the more circle doesn't help if we're in plain strain or with 3D stress states. How to use this analytical approach for 3D um, state of stress? That's tougher, I, I guess. I'm not going to do that as a half an hour presentation. Um, uh, I think, again, I, I'm getting the feeling that maybe I should do a separate video, which I'll post somewhere. It should just be like a standalone, talking a little bit more about more circle. I kind of got the bit between my teeth here. So uh, I, I will do more of more circle. I promise, David, that's the last time we use that pun. Um, 
So, I love it. It's a good one. <laughs> Um, there's a couple of other questions along those lines. Darren's saying, does the Moore circle help with the stress state transformation through the thickness, the thick structures? Can we break the 3D to a 2D layer? If you can assume something as a plain stress state, um, then you, you can do this. So even if it's a 3D stress state, really, but you can assume plain stress, we can do that. Um, whether you can do that for plain strain, uh, I'm not quite sure. Again, I need to do a little bit of research on that. I'll do that. And then the curated q and I'll, I'll perhaps follow up with a statement on that. Is it a good idea to use strain more circle for composite materials, or should we stick with classical laminate theories to solve the problem? That's coming from Shai. That's a very, very good question. I'm afraid I'm a great believer in a strain-based criteria for, for composites. I do follow, and I we do a whole, uh, do a whole class on uh, composite failure criteria. But basically, um, if you're looking at... Um, uh, sai Wu or more advanced failure criteria, it's a stress-based approach, we can drop back and say, I'm going to just say, you know, I've got a strain limit, and uh, don't quote me on this, but maybe 3,000 microstrain, 4,000 microstrain, that can envelope a lot of um, uh, 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 damage states, uh, initial uh, uh, abuse loads, uh, pre-damage, lots of things like that. It gives you a lot of big safety factors, it's very conservative. And aligned with that, you might well use a strain more circle to say, I can actually look at the components of that. So I can see showing that linking together uh, pretty well there. I think, David, um, uh, we're just about there. Um, uh, David's going to be sending me the, the Q&A list. So any I've missed off here, um, I'll try and again uh, slip in there. But I think at that point, uh, in the interest of time, we're just at the top of the hour. So I'm going to go back to a nice marketing slide here for, for David. So let's get back to, there we go, right there. And so thank you very much, everybody, for listening. I'll cura, cura, curate this, get the Q&A sorted, and then we'll post the video over. So over to you, David, now to, to wrap up the session for us. Beautiful. So it looks like we have no more questions. Is that is that what we're seeing, Tony? No. See, you're not the only person who can make a pun. That's the thing. Uh, thank you very much, everyone, for attending. Uh, and I'm glad you have all enjoyed today's session. Just to give you an update on the poll, uh, did Tony convince you about Moore's Circle? Uh, the vast majority of people who answered the poll uh, answered yes. There were only eight people who said they weren't convinced, Tony. I'll send you their names and addresses and you can, <laughs> you can follow up with them. <laughs> Maybe Moore has an estate. He's got relatives. Maybe they, they, can, uh, they can do something about it. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. But thank you very much, everyone, for uh, joining us on Friday afternoon. Uh, I saw one chat message there that said someone had joined in on their day off today. So, you know, more power to you. We're wow. glad that glad that everyone's still enjoying it. We will be back again next week at the same time. The registration link is already live on the NFM's website, so you can sign up uh, for next week's uh, episode, episode five on nonlinear buckling. Why do we cheat in FEA? But for now, like Tony says, we'll be posting the videos and the curated Q&A on YouTube and the respective websites. And all that remains for me to do is to wish you all a happy weekend. Uh, stay safe and bye for now. Bye, everybody. Take care. <laughs>